talk this evening is titled, Peace is War. Ever since its colonial project was set in motion, Zionism has insisted that it seeks to colonize Palestine peacefully. Indeed, that the colonization of the country will not only not harm the native population, but that it would be of benefit to them. The movement's founder, Theodore Herzl, himself provided two visions of this future. A fictional public vision advertised in his futurist novel, Alt Neuland, where Palestine would become a Jewish state, allowing coexistence with the native Arabs who would be happy and grateful for being colonized and civilized by European Jews, and the secret logistical and practical strategy to evict the Arab population out of the country, which he spelled out in his diaries. Herzl's dual approach of declaring peaceful intentions for public consumption, behind which he sought to hide Zionism's violent strategy of conquering the land of the Palestinians, would be adopted wholesale thenceforward and continues to be the cornerstone of Israeli policy to the present. Indeed, long before George Orwell popularized the expression, war is peace, in his 1949 novel, Zionism understood well that its colonial strategy depended on a deliberate and insistent confusion of the binary terms war and peace, so that each of them hides behind the other as one and the same strategy. Peace will always be the public name of a colonial war, and war, once it became necessary and public in the form of invasions, would be articulated as the principal means to achieve the sought after peace. Waging war as peace is so central to Zionist and Israeli propaganda that Israel's 1982 invasion of Lebanon, which killed 20,000 civilians, was actually termed Operation Peace for Galilee. War and peace, therefore, are the same means whose only and ultimate strategic goal is European Jewish colonization of Palestine and the subjugation and expulsion of Palestine's Arab population. To bring about the expulsion of the Palestinians and the establishment of the Jewish settler colony, Herzl sought the patronage of the powers that controlled the fate of Palestine whereas his assiduous efforts to court the Ottomans and persuade them to grant him a charter failed, the Zionist leadership after him adopted his strategy and successfully secured the patronage of Britain, which became the master of Palestine after World War I, as well as Britain's Hashemite clients whom the British set up as rulers of Iraq and Transjordan. The British themselves pledged in their infamous Balfour Declaration that the European Jewish colonization of Palestine would be conducted under their patronage peacefully in such a manner, and I quote, that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, unquote. After World War II, Zionists successfully secured U.S. support for their colonial project. The Zionist leader, Vladimir Jabotinsky, following Herzl's strategy of securing the patronage of major world powers, articulated the Zionist position thus. I shall quote him. Zionist colonization must either stop or else proceed regardless of the native population, which means that it can proceed and develop only under the protection of a power that is independent of the native population behind an iron wall which the native population cannot breach. That is our Arab policy. Not what it should be, but what it is actually, whether we admit it or not. What need we otherwise, otherwise of the Balfour Declaration or of the British Mandate? Their value to us is that outside, an outside power has undertaken to create in the country such conditions of administration and security that if the native population should desire to hinder our work, they will find it impossible." End of quote. None of this, however, meant that the Zionists abandoned their public claims that their peaceful colonization of the country would not be harmful to the Palestinians while employing at the same time the most violent means to evict the Palestinians off their land. 
It was, in fact, this public Zionist commitment to peace with the Palestinians, whose land they sought to conquer, that provoked the ire of Jabotinsky. The Zionist leader's assumption that the Palestinians were bribable, that they could be bought, and that they would accept Jewish domination in exchange for nominal economic benefits was challenged by Jabotinsky on every count. He declared as early as 1923, this is right after the beginning of the British Mandate, the following, I, also, I quote him again. Our peacemongers are trying to persuade us that the Arabs are either fools whom we can deceive by masking our real aims, or that they are corrupt and can be bribed to abandon to us their claim to priority in Palestine in return for cultural and economic advantages. I repudiate this conception of the Palestinian Arabs. Culturally, they are 500 years behind us. They have neither our endurance nor our determination, but they are just as good psychologists as we are. We may tell them whatever we like about the innocence of our aims, watering them down, and sweetening, sweetening them with honeyed words to make them palatable. But they know what we want, as well as we know what they do not want. They feel at least the same instinctive jealous love of Palestine as the old Aztecs felt for the ancient Mexico and the Sioux for the rolling prairies." Unquote. For Jabotinsky, the racism of the Zionist leaders was blinding them to the pitfalls of their strategy. Understanding that no amount of money and no amount of honeyed words have ever convinced a people to hand over their country to foreign conquerors, he understood that the Palestinians must be defeated militarily as the precondition to their acquiescence in the Zionist project of stealing their country. In this regard, he added, and this is the sort of a, a very important, I think, policy that uh, uh, he articulated, saying, to imagine, as our Arabophiles do, that the Palestinians will voluntarily consent to the realization of Zionism in return for the moral and material conveniences which the Jewish colonists bring with them is a childish notion, which has at bottom a kind of contempt for the Arab people. Jabotinsky continues, it means that they despise the Arab race, which they regard as a corrupt mob that can be bought and sold, and are willing to give up their fatherland for a good railway system. There is no justification for such a belief. It may be that some individual Arabs take bribes, but that does not mean that the Arab people of Palestine as a whole will sell that fervent patriotism that they guard so jealously, and which even the Papuans will never sell. Every native population in the world resists colonists as long as it has the slightest hope of being able to rid itself of the danger of being colonized." Unquote. Hence, for Jabotinsky, the proper and correct way to secure the Palestinians' acquiescence is to obliterate any possibility that they could ever stop the colonization of their country or reverse it once it had been achieved. This will be carried out first by securing an imperial sponsor for the establishment of the Jewish settler colony and by creating what he called an iron wall defended by a Zionist army which the Palestinians could not breach. Only then, he surmised, would the Palestinians be ready for a peaceful settlement with their colonial conquerors. He concludes, this does not mean that there cannot be any agreement with the Palestine Arabs. What is impossible is a voluntary agreement. As long as the Arabs feel that there is at least hope of getting, or the least hope of getting rid of us, they will refuse to give up this hope in return for either kind words or for bread and butter, because they are not a rabble, but a living people. And when a living people yields in matters of such a vital character, it is only when there is no longer any hope of getting rid of us because they can make no breach in our iron wall. Not till then will they drop their extremist leaders whose watchword is never, and the leadership will pass then to the moderate groups who will approach us with a proposal that we should both agree to uh, mutual concessions. Then, he says, we may expect them to discuss honestly practical questions, such as a guarantee against Arab displacement or even equal rights for Arab citizens, or even Arab national integrity. 
And when that happens, I am convinced that we Jews will be found ready to give them satisfactory guarantees so that both peoples can live together in peace like good neighbors." End of quote. Jabotinsky's views would guide all branches of the Zionist movement after him, not least the dominant labor Zionism led by David Ben-Gurion, who was Israel's first prime minister and who served for many years as prime minister. Like Herzl, Ben-Gurion would advocate peace with the Palestinians publicly, claiming that the interests of the colonists and the natives were not contradictory, while strategically planning war against the Palestinians in the meetings of the Zionist leadership. However, it would be the logic of Jabotinsky's arguments that would guide him. In 1936, amid the great Palestinian revolt against Zionist colonization and British occupation, Ben-Gurion declared, and I quote him, it is not in order to establish peace in the country that we need an agreement. Peace is indeed a vital matter for us. It is impossible to build a country in a permanent state of war, but peace for us is a means. The end is the complete and full realization of Zionism. Only for that do we need an agreement." Unquote. Echoing Jabotinsky, Ben-Gurion understood that a comprehensive peace agreement with the Palestinians was inconceivable in the 1930s, when the Jewish colonists remained an armed and bellicose minority in the land of the Palestinians. He concluded, and I quote him, for only after total despair on the part of the Arabs, despair that will come not only from the failure of disturbances and the attempt at rebellion, but also as a consequence of our growth in the country, may the Arabs possibly acquiesce in the Jewish land of Israel." Unquote. Elaborating on the idea that peace is war, Ben-Gurion explained clearly to his fellow Zionists that any peace agreement with an Arab party must be designed to formalize their capitulation to Zionist colonization. This he declared as early as 1949, following the military triumph of the Zionists and their establishment of the settler colony. He tells us, Egypt is a big state. If we could arrive at the conclusion of peace with it, it would be a tremendous conquest for us." Unquote. That conquest would have to wait 30 years. But when it was realized through the Camp David Accords with Anwar Sadat in 1978, it formalized Egypt's recognition of the legitimation or the, or the legitimacy of the Jewish settler colony, the denial of Palestinian sovereignty or rights, except in some deferred autonomy plan, and Egypt's acquiescence in never re-establishing its sovereignty over the Sinai Peninsula, which Israel would return to Egyptian partial control, but without sovereignty. As you know, until today, the, Israeli ar the Egyptian army is not allowed in the Sinai in the last few months. There were some uh, arrangements made between Israel and the new Egyptian coup leaders to allow certain contingents of the, Israeli, of the Egyptian army into Sinai to stop acts of violence that Israel felt threatened not only the Egyptians, but also its own borders. The conquest of Egypt, of which Ben-Gurion spoke in 1949, was completed at Camp David. At the time, the Palestinians, represented by the Palestine Liberation Organization, or the PLO, had not yet come around formally to accepting that the colonization of their country was irreversible and continued to seek its liberation from European Jewish colonialism. As the idea of peace as a means to establish more colonial conquests continued to be entrenched in Zionist considerations, it would be pursued alongside formal war even after Camp David, as evidenced by the multiple invasions of Lebanon in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and in the new century. These wars would be waged explicitly as part of Israel's pursuit of peace to achieve colonial aims. The American convening of the 1991 peace conference in Madrid, to which they invited Israel and all the Arab protagonists, excluding the PLO, would not inaugurate a new phase in Israeli strategy as much as formalize its new approach since 1977. Namely, concluding peace deals with Arab and Palestinian leaders who, in the words of Jabotinsky, had given up hope, capitulated completely to Jewish colonization, and promised not only not to resist Israel, but to help it along, 
while continuing the war against those Arabs and Palestinians who continue to resist Zionism's colonial logic. In the wake of the 1973 war, the U.S. had started an earlier version of the so-called peace process, one that fully adopted the Jabotinskian model. The U.S. was represented then by Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Kissinger's plan, which would lead in a few years to Egypt's capitulation at Camp David, was to eventually include the PLO in peace talks, whereby the organization would only be invited, according to Kissinger, after Egypt, Jordan, and Syria had recognized and accepted the irreversibility of the Jewish settler colony. Kissinger declared, and I quote him, we need first to get them, meaning the PLO, under control and bring them only at the end of the process, unquote. Recognizing that talking to the PLO of the 1970s, which even then was willing to concede many of the rights of the Palestinian people, was not still ready to fully resign itself to the irreversibility of Jewish colonization, Kissinger added, quote, we cannot deliver the minimum demands of the PLO at present, so why talk to them? Kissinger continued and explained that, quote, recognition will come at the very end, after all the Arab governments had been satisfied, unquote. While the U.S. could not deliver the minimum to the PLO in the 1970s, Israel would be able to do so in the 1990s. It was in this context that 20 years ago, the PLO accepted to fully surrender to Israel and accept its colonization of Palestine in what came to be known as the Oslo Accords. The abandonment of the anti-colonial struggle would be first formalized with the unofficial dissolution of the Palestine Liberation Organization, especially the liberation part of its name, and its re-emergence as the Palestinian National Authority, or the PA, an authority that no longer sought to liberate anything, much less offer any resistance to colonialism. Instead, the PA would offer its services to Israel by collaborating with its forces and suppressing any Palestinian resistance to Jewish colonization while seeking guarantees from Israel for a modicum of privileges that could sustain it, I meaning the PA itself, in power. The PA, however, proved to be even more of a collaborator with Israel than Jabotinsky had thought possible. Jabotinsky had postulated that after resigning themselves to their defeat, those Palestinian leaders who demanded maximal liberation would be removed. And if you recall, he told us the leadership will pass to moderate groups who will approach us with a proposal that we should agree to mutual concessions, right? including things like a guarantee against Arab dis displace displacement, equal rights for Arab citizens, or Arab national integrity, as he put it. The PA, as is evident to everyone now, has never made such demands whatsoever. It had abandoned Palestinian citizens of Israel altogether, who were not even mentioned in Oslo, and has indeed done its share in displacing Palestinians in the West Bank for the benefit of construction projects sponsored by its own Palestinian businessmen, such as the Rawabi project. It is uh, billed as the first planned Palestinian city in the West Bank run and owned by a Palestinian uh, businessman who came from abroad, and wherein the PA, in fact, forced Palestinians off their lands and homes to build this new construction project for upper middle class Palestinians who serve uh, the PA and the Oslo uh, process. D doing so, of course, while acceding to the ongoing Israeli displacement of Palestinians from their land, ongoing as we speak today in the Jordan Valley and elsewhere. As for Arab national integrity of which Jabotinsky spoke, the PA does not pretend to have any, much less demand that Israel guarantee it. Jabotinsky's were pessimistic expectations regarding Palestinian surrender, namely, quote, that we cannot offer any adequate compensation to the Palestinian Arabs in return for Palestine, and therefore there is no likelihood of any voluntary agreement being reached so that all those, as he said, who regard such an agreement as a condition sine qua non for Zionism may as well say no and withdraw from the movement, unquote. Contrary to Jabotinsky's pessimism, however, and as part of the Oslo Accords, a sufficient amount of financial compensation was offered and indeed accepted by the Palestinian Authority in return for Palestine. 
The amount has so far reached $23 billion, but no worries, more is on the way. As I argued at the time of the Oslo signing, Israel's formula for the peace agreement, namely land for peace, to which the PLO acceded, prejudices the entire process by presupposing that Israel has land which it would be willing to give to the Arabs, and that the Arabs, seen as responsible for the state of war with Israel, can grant Israel the peace for which it has longed for decades. This formula is in fact a reflection of the racial views characterizing European Jewish Israelis and Palestinian and other Arabs. Whereas the Israelis are being asked and are ostensibly presented as willing to negotiate about property, the recognized Western bourgeois right par excellence, Palestinians and other Arabs are being asked to give up violence, or more precisely, their violent means, which of course is an illegitimate, unrecognized right attributable only to barbarians. At the time of the signing of Oslo, I explained that the accords amounted to the following. Israel, I said then, will continue to control the land, the waters, the borders, the economy, Jewish settlements, in short, everything it had sought to control without Palestinian resistance and its necessary suppression, which would cause the possible death of Jewish soldiers in the process. The PLO has pledged that no such resistance will be allowed. Now it is Palestinian security men who would kill the Palestinian boys and girls whom Israeli Jewish uh, army soldiers would have had to kill, endangering themselves in the process. Meanwhile, the Israelis will be reminding the world that their previous murderous campaigns against the Palestinians must have been justified, as it is now the Palestinians themselves in the guise of the PA who recognize the necessity of controlling a savage and a recalcitrant population. In line with Jabotinsky and Ben-Gurion, Israel's foreign minister at the time and its current president, Shimon Peres, recognized that when Israel finally recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinians, it did so because the PLO no longer sought to reverse Jewish colonialism. He declared correctly, we have not changed, it is the PLO that changed, unquote. Since Oslo, overall Jewish colonization of the West Bank and East Jerusalem has doubled. But if we exclude East Jerusalem, which was annexed to Israel formally in 1980, Jewish colonization of the West Bank since Oslo has in fact tripled. This tripling of, uh, this tripling of the colonization has taken place peacefully under the umbrella of Oslo. All Palestinian attempts to suppress it, whether during the Second Intifada or through the electoral success of Hamas and daily acts of resistance against the Israeli military would be suppressed by Israel and by the Palestinian Authority. In the case of Hamas, its suppression would be greatly intensified with the collaboration of the Mubarak regime in Egypt and more recently with the coup regime of General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Through the strategy of peace is war, Israel has also sought to change the vocabulary used to describe its colonial project by insisting that the Palestinians must submit to its own nomenclature, which the US and the European media used to cover over Zionist colonialism. In the history of colonial wars and anti-colonial resistance, especially in the context of settler colonies, the struggles of natives against European colonists have always been named liberation struggles. Examples include the Algerian liberation struggle against French colonialism and colonists, the Zimbabwean people's liberation struggle against British colonialism and colonists, and the anti-apartheid struggle for the liberation in so of South Africa against the racial privileges of white colonists. In none of these cases was the struggle for liberation from colonialism referred to primarily or secondarily as a conflict. Indeed, there has never been such a technical term as the Algerian-French conflict or a white-black Rhodesian or South African conflict either, not even for the colonists themselves. In these cases, both the settler colonists and those resisting them were not shy in naming their struggle as a struggle for colonial and racial supremacist privilege or for liberation from racism and settler colonialism, respectively. 
This nomenclature would also apply to Zionist settler colonialism in Palestine and to Palestinian resistance. The project of European Jewish colonization of Palestine, which started in the 1880s and has not abated since, remains the most spectacular fact of the Palestinian encounter with Zionism. But it is simultaneously the most strenuously guarded open secret. This is the case so much that to refer to Israel as the Jewish settler colony in Israel or in pro-Israel Europe and the US, which is how Palestinians and Arabs have always described it, is an unbreakable taboo and elicits wide condemnation in those rare cases when it is broken. Indeed, not only has the European Jewish colonization of Palestine been renamed by Zionism and its European and American allies as a so-called Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but Zionism has insisted that the Palestinians and the Arabs must also adopt this nomenclature as a precondition to any kind of dialogue, much less acceptance of, the, of those Palestinians as partners for dialogue, let alone for peace negotiations. As Zionism understands that it lives in a world where colonialism, and certainly settler colonialism, are no longer openly fashionable, this renaming is central to its camouflage propaganda operation. The Palestinians understood Israeli stat strategy all along and continued unhindered to insist on their liberatory names, that the Palestinian organization that represented Palestinian resistance until 1993 called itself the Palestine Liberation Organization, that, it, that its constituent guerrilla groups called themselves the Movement for the Liberation of Palestine, known by its acronym Fatah, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, or the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, understood, this is all, all these organizations understood their encounter with Zionism as one with settler colonialism and the racist structures of such an endeavor, which they insisted on resisting and overthrowing. The post that that post-1993, the PLO metamorphosed into the Palestinian Authority, not only christened the new goal of the Palestinian leadership as one of establishing a national authority rather than to liberate Palestine and the Palestinians from settler colonialism, but the word colonialism itself no longer figured in that vocabulary either. The new understanding of European Jewish colonialism as a Palestinian-Israeli conflict that should be resolved through a peaceful settlement via negotiations became operative throughout the peace offensive which Israel waged against the Palestinian people in 1991. 20 years of peace negotiations brought about more colonialism, more theft of Palestinian lands, more Palestinian deaths, more Palestinian poverty, more restrictions on the movement of the Palestinians, more unemployment. In short, more oppression on every front. Yet the PA continues to declare without equivocation that it recognizes the right of Jews to colonize Palestine and to set up a Jewish settler colony on the lands that the Zionists conquered in 1948, as well as the rights of those same Jews as colonial settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, which they conquered in 1967. What it asks for, however, is that the Israelis not increase the existing number of Jewish colonists in the West Bank, but not in East Jerusalem, and that a Bantustan-like state be set up for the PA to rule over Palestinians without sovereignty. The Israelis are appalled by these conditions and continue to push the PA to declare openly and without equivocation that whatever arrangement Israel will bestow on PA leaders in the guise of a Bantustan state, Israel's conditions remain that the Palestinians must accept not only the right of existing Jewish colonists to continue to colonize all parts of Palestine, but also their future rights to colonize more of the land, short of which the Israelis insist there will be no peace deal. Of course, Israel insists that it would continue in the meantime to wage peace, to convince the PA leadership of the importance of their full acquiescence in its comprehensive colonial project. The ongoing secret negotiations between Israel and the PA at present aim to devise a plan wherein the Palestinian Authority and Israel find the right formula to bring this acquiescence about so that Jewish colonization of the entire land of the Palestinians will be finally supported 
and celebrated by the Palestinians themselves, and the century-old Zionist war against the Palestinian people will finally be won under the banner of peace. The only problem is that the Palestinian people, unlike the PA leadership, refuse to acquiesce in Zionism's colonial project, as they have not given up hope, but remain full of hope that the colonization of their land is reversible and that their resistance will ultimately bring it to an end, irrespective of the deals concluded by their collaborating leadership and of Israel's waging of peace as war. Thank you. The question is about um, the changing in the terms of, uh, uh, of the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza after the collapse of Oslo. And my response is that Oslo has not fully collapsed in the sense that they, while we recognize that Oslo is not actually a process that wants to reach a resolution, but rather a process that wants to continue and persist as a process. You see, uh, Oslo was set up uh, with many beneficiaries, the PA and a wide sector of Palestinians who serve the PA, either in its security apparatuses or in its bureaucratic apparatuses. As a result, the $23 billion that I mentioned, uh, which uh, uh, have been already poured into the PA coffers since 1993, are engineered to, keep, to oil those wheels. And uh, everyone there understands that to continue, for this money to continue to arrive, the process, one, need not uh, uh, fail, and two, need not succeed. Because if, if it succeeds, then the money will stop, the, the, the so-called conflict will have been resolved, and the kinds of services that the PA continues to provide will no longer be necessary. So the important thing for most of the recipients of this aid is that the process continues as a process, as an interminable process. I mean, remember, when, the Occup when the Oslo began, in, or, or the Madrid talks began in 1991, the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem had only been under occupation for 24 years. Today, it's been 23 years or 22 years of negotiations to end a 24-year occupation. Now the occupation, of course, has become uh, 46 years old and uh, is continuing. So it's unclear how many more years of negotiations are needed to end that 24-year occupation. Um, so in that sense, uh, uh, and as, as we saw also earlier on and as the negotiations began, the European and American media immediately stopped using the term occupation. The West Bank and Gaza came to be seen as disputed territories, not occupied territories. This, of course, removes them from international law and the regulations of the Geneva Conventions of the people and uh, territories living under occupation. This would be actually facilitated in 1988 by the Jordan's King and the PLO uh, coming together and declaring that Jordan will sever ties, legal and administ administrative ties, with the West Bank which made Israel argue, well, if Jordan is no longer the party from whom we occupied this land, then the West Bank and Gaza have no party. There, there was no sovereign party in possession of them. And as a result, they are not really occupied lands. They are merely disputed lands, right? So, uh, and, uh, so this, this became very, very important. So as a result, not only have the Palestinians who uh, in Oslo accepted the colonization of the majority of Palestine, which fell to the Zionists in 1948, i.e. 78% of the land, but now we're accepting the designation of the remaining 22% as disputed, not as occupied territories, whom they nominally uh, were negotiating over, but ultimately the Israelis, of course, in Oslo made no such promises. All the Israelis agreed to in the signing of Oslo is that for the first time in their history, they now recognize the Palestine Liberation Organization as the legitimate representative of the Palestinians, which they had refused to recognize before. All that meant that if the Israelis were inclined to have any kinds of talks or negotiations with the Palestinians, they would do so with the PLO but there was no promise of a uh, self-determination, no promise for uh, the establishment of a state, that none of this was actually in Oslo. 
It was simply uh, seen as this kind of recognition, no more. The question uh, is that, uh, taking the premise that the two-state solution is dead, the recent elections, the, the, the city council for Jerusalem, uh, which includes uh, about 200,000 Palestinian uh, 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 citizens of the, who, who live in that city and have always lived in that city uh, uh, participating in the elections. About one and a half percent of them actually participated in the vote. Uh, the question is, does this, uh, could a larger participation in these kinds of elections bring about a one-state solution? You see, I mean, I think there's already a one state, right? But it, it, but it is a racist one state, right? Which is governed by uh, a, a Jewish minority. E even, of course, remember, the, number, the demographics are also uh, interesting because on the one hand, the Israelis now claim that there is, if you include the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, that uh, the demographic seems to be almost 50-50. But remember, the way Israel also counts its Jewish population, I mean, nobody knows the methodology. And they seem to include about like one million Israeli Jews uh, who live in the US or live outside as part of the country. Um, so it's unclear. I mean, the, many uh, conjecture that indeed uh, the demographic uh, war has already been lost uh, for, the, for Israeli Jews, that despite the huge amount of expulsion of the majority of the Palestinians, they are still stuck with enough Palestinians that they are outnumbered. And if you include, of course, the fact that the million Russian Jews, alleged Russian Jews, who arrived in the country between 1990 and 2000, ended up in their majority not being of Jewish background at all, but pretended to be Jewish or partially Jewish to exit Russia for economic reasons and have taken now over Palestinian Orthodox Church and cemeteries and refused to integrate in Israel, continue to have their own Russian newspapers, etc. Then the, the, the demographics become even more tricky than uh, uh, Israel would like us to believe. But even if the demographics are exactly what Israel says they are, remember this is a, a country which has upwards between 35 to 60 racist laws that privilege Jews over non-Jews, right? And so whether Palestinians uh, participate in elections or not would not make it a, a sort of a democratic one country solution. Remember, I mean, the, in, in South Africa, the uh, apartheid regime in the early 80s made concessions to coloreds and Indians by allowing sort of the tricameral uh, uh, arrangement, allowing them to vote, etc. But the, the apartheid system remained, even if you have the right to vote in, in a certain way. So uh, in the case, of course, of the Palestinians uh, of East Jerusalem, the attempt has been from the start to separate them from the West Bank and Gaza. As I mentioned in uh, the talk, uh, East Jerusalem was a uh, de jure uh, had annexed in 1980. It had been de facto annexed in 1967, immediately after uh, the occupation. Now, uh, in 90, at the end of the 1948-49 war, Jordan acquired central and eastern Palestine, which included East Jerusalem. Jordan renamed that territory, east of the central Palestine, in 1950 as the West Bank, and renamed uh, uh, Transjordan as the East Bank. Now, this new nomenclature that the, the Jordanians accorded the territory included, of course, East Jerusalem. That when you said the West Bank, it meant all the towns and cities in the West Bank. You never had to say the West Bank and East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem at the time was uh, six square kilometers uh, uh, in size. After 1967, the Israelis, of course, one separated East Jerusalem from the rest of the West Bank in terms of the kinds of military laws imposed on the rest of the West Bank and began to refer to it as the uh, united capital of Israel. And since then, people had to say now West Bank and East Jerusalem as if uh, basically acceding to uh, the new Israeli nomenclature. Now, in doing so, of course, the, the idea of trying to grant uh, Palestinian Palestinians of East Jerusalem, a different status, have been going on since 1980. And have, of course, been met with much resistance, both cultural resistance, sometimes violent resistance, but also peaceful resistance for the most part in demonstrations. And of course, the majority of the lands and homes of East Jerusalem um, continue to be taken by the, Israel, by, by the Israeli Jewish municipality um, for the purposes, of course, of Jewish colonial settlement. So in this sense, now, of course, what the Israelis also have done is multiplied the area of East Jerusalem. So East Jerusalem began to be expanded. At some point, it became 10% 
of what international law knows as the West Bank. And at this point now, what they call metropolitan East Jerusalem could be as large as one third of the West Bank. So when the Israelis speak about the West Bank, what they mean is the West Bank minus one third of the West Bank, which they call East Jerusalem, and minus, of course, the 10% area which, is now, which now lies behind the apartheid wall, which they built in the last 15 years, and minus the 10% of the area in the Jordan Valley, which the Israelis say they will not withdraw from and take their military out of it. So if you take all this out, really the West Bank ends up being about 44% of the West Bank. Um, and then they say we will give 90% of that West Bank to some form of municipal Bantustanish uh, uh, arrangement with the PA. Uh, now, on the other hand, the whole issue of uh, one state, uh, which was being proposed sometimes by prag pragmatic Palestinians who had given up hope, like uh, Sari Nusebe in the late 70s, who said, well, Palestinians, uh, some had even advocated that the Palestinians convert to Judaism and exercise the right of return to Israel to be able to take back their land. I suspect Orthodox rabbis would not certify this conversion. But the idea was then, okay, well, if Israel annexes all the West Bank and Gaza, the Palestinians will become citizens. Of course, I mean, the, 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 you cannot, right? I mean, we, we understand how the situation worked uh, uh, for Palestinians inside Israel. Remember, I mean, the, the way Israel was able to control that population initially was through, uh, the, through the military government, uh, but also uh, until today, Palestinian citizens of Israel who were expelled off their land, uh, or even those who were not expelled off their land, continue to lose their land to Israeli Jewish confiscation, right? I mean, even the, the, the land that was confiscated in the 1970s and, and the Israeli policy of the Judaization of Galilee, which took up a lot of the land surrounding Nazareth and set up the, uh, the Israeli Jewish, uh, ex ex exclusively a Jewish city of Upper Nazareth, or uh, Nazareth Elite, uh, whose uh, uh, mayor today speaks about how he wants to prevent any uh, Christmas decorations from uh, being uh, uh, brandished publicly uh, in this mostly Palestinian Christian town. Um, uh, they all attempts to fight this in the courts, most attempts to fight this in the courts, have uh, been defeated. There are some uh, minor and symbolic uh, uh, triumphs for Palestinians, but hardly ever in terms of keeping their lands, right? So I, I, I mean, simply being integrated in the, in the settler colony as it exists with a battery of racist laws that give uh, Jewish colonial settlers and their progeny rights and privileges denied to the native population will not solve the problem, you see. Uh, I mean, we, we see the problems already in post-1994 South Africa, where finally uh, uh, South African blacks, colored Indians, and whites have the same political rights, but not the same economic rights. We've seen how the white minority continues to dominate uh, South Africa today about 20 years after the end of apartheid, because, of course, the price of the end of political apartheid in South Africa was the maintenance of economic apartheid. That was the deal that the ANC brokered with the U.S., and with the IMF and with the World Bank. So that would be, of course, a great future for the Palestinians, given what they have now. But even that kind of a political e equality clause, say, that what, like what happened in post-1990 for South Africa, has not guaranteed the end of colonial privileges, certainly not economic privileges. I think participating in these elections uh, under uh, uh, these conditions would not be to their advantage, yes. But, uh, but again, remember, it's not, I mean, I. I say this by saying if they vote, they will lose, and if they don't vote, they will lose. Because this is not, it's not a matter of equal players and you have to play the game. No, the game is rigged. And all possibilities of your participation or non-participation will guarantee that your oppressor will always come on top. So this is the thing. If they vote, they will lose, and if they don't vote, they will lose. Either way, they have, because they don't control the options, you see. So the only options available to them are always the options Israel makes available to them. And Israel only makes options available to them that serve its own interests. No option is made available to the Palestinians that in any way could hinder Israeli interests. The question is that, um, uh, that the PA has acceded to Israeli control, but the Second Intifada gives us an example of a kind of resistance to that by the PA. Um, and this seems to have um, caused a large uh, number of Palestinian injuries and deaths. Uh, is there an alternative to this? I, you know, listen, I don't think um, 
I mean, uh, uh, the Second Intifada, first of all, of course, the Israelis were very harsh from the first moment. The idea was to kill as many people as possible to drive people into using violence to justify Israel's counterviolence. If you compare the numbers of those Israel killed during the First Intifada versus the Second Intifada, what Israel would kill in a whole month or two months period in the First Intifada, it would kill in one day in the Second Intifada. The idea was precisely to provoke people into a violent response. And of course, at that time, the Palestinian security um, on, in, on some occasions ended up intervening, but most of the time, the role had been before and after to suppress Palestinian resistance to Israeli colonialism. If you recall, in 1994, upon arriving in Gaza, uh, Arafat unleashed his security goons on Palestinians in the, uh, in the Islamic University of Gaza, who murdered 14 Palestinians for attempting to resist Israeli colonialism at that time. Uh, that was, of course, the opening bid so that the Americans will trust him. At the time, Al Gore was very, very happy with his performance, as was, of course, President Clinton. Um, and this would continue until 99 and 2000, the summer of 2000, when the so-called Camp David um, talks took place, and Arafat finally told them that he could not really sign the final defeat of his people and continue to have any authority. Uh, uh, and so that was the context uh, within which, uh, or the background to what would happen in September when Ariel Sharon would go with Israeli uh, soldiers to Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, provoking and triggering the Second Intifada. Now, um, I think uh, Palestine, any kind of Palestinian violent resistance, while guaranteed by international law against Israeli security services and the army, I don't think will, has worked and will work. I think in the sense that the, 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 the balance of power is so huge that Palestinians will always lose. But there are other ways, right? I mean, the, remember that the collaboration in the West Bank has been such that even the cement that Israel used to build the apartheid wall and the colonial settlements is provided by Palestinian businessmen who are in power in the PA who collaborate with it. The majority of workers who build the colonial settlements are poor Palestinian workers who are unemployed and have no other jobs and end up being forced to go and build the colonial settlements on the lands that were stolen from them uh, by uh, uh, the Israeli Jewish uh, government. So um, there could be, of course, all kinds of uh, uh, general strikes, major marches on uh, 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 all the checkpoints, on, um, I mean, on uh, an intifada against the Palestinian authority. Uh, all of this could, be, could happen uh, without uh, violence. Uh, Palestinians have continued to be killed by the Israelis for resisting non-violently, but the PA, for example, or no one within the PA has uh, organized or wanted to organize such major peaceful marches. There are, of course, these marches can continue in the village of Berlin, in several villages against the wall, you see Palestinians organizing, but it's not a mass strike. Remember, I mean, a good portion of Ramallah has been turned into a green zone, uh, not unlike that of Baghdad, for the Palestinian elite, who suddenly in the last 15 and 20 years um, have, saw, have seen fit to have uh, uh, new sushi restaurants and foie gras be available to them. Well, given the money that, you know, that was pouring on them, it had to go somewhere, um, and build new villas, in, a, in addition, of course, to the new Palestinian colonial settlements, uh, uh, like Rawabi and others that are planned. Palestinian businessmen from the diaspora saw fit to come in and do business with Israeli counterparts. The, the horrific Palestinian businessman, uh, uh, Munib Masri, has built himself some, you know, uh, 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 faux Italian uh, uh, palace uh, uh, in Nablus and what have you. So, uh, so what, what you have is an exact attempt, you know, I mean, what, what happened is the co-optation of the Palestinians. Remember that the PA arrived in 94 precisely at the end of a very successful, peaceful uprising for six years and it demobilized it. The condition of the signing of Oslo was that the PLO would no longer fund the resisting population uh, uh, and their steadfastness. So as a result, the NGOs, of course, became very important in this. The Americans poured in, and the Europeans poured in uh, NGOs to co-opt all the activists of the Antifada. So if you're uh, uh, sort of a, a unionist who uh, fought 
against the Israelis as a representative of workers, the NGOs would come in and say, oh, we're interested in workers' rights. Why don't we give you, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars a month and you can head this NGO and continue to fight for workers' rights. You defend women's rights, brilliant. We have several NGOs for you. Why don't you come? And this way, of course, the major leadership of the mobilization between 1987 and 93 were co-opted uh, uh, by these NGOs. A new generation has, of course, grown up. Poverty is horrific. Uh, of course, in Gaza, it is unequaled. But even in the West Bank, outside of the green zone of Ramallah, and, in, and especially in the countryside and in the refugee camps, continues to rise. And uh, the checkpoints and the Israeli security uh, is what controls it. Um, now, the idea was that in the last two or three years, with uh, the massive demonstrations and uprisings in neighboring Arab countries, that something will happen in the West Bank and Gaza. But the idea was, again, there's a, a kind of fatigue of uh, previous types of uh, 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 policies that were pursued, uh, aside from the first Intifada. Hamas itself seems to be going down the road of uh, Fatih in terms of being more interested in remaining in power over a land that it has no sovereignty over, uh, uh, rather than actually organize uh, uh, this kind of a popular resistance and not a violent kind of resistance to the Israeli occupation. But I think um, uh, there is a lot of that happening on a smaller scale. It's not yet at a general level. And one never knows what will trigger the general mobilization. At the international level and locally, I think BDS has been a, a big success, something that the Israelis have been worried about exceedingly. Uh, last week, there was a, a, an attempt to, uh, uh, an arrest actually, I think, made of an Israeli Navy officer who was, uh, uh, for his role in the invasion of Lebanon in 2006 for war crimes in Britain. Uh, Israeli army uh, generals are increasingly very concerned about traveling to Europe because of these kinds of court cases that Palestinians are bringing against them, and there should be more of those. BDS, which has become a uh, very successful uh, in, in Britain, uh, across Europe, and a number of countries, uh, and e even has made some headway in Canada in cultural institutions. In the US, it's still trying hard it's, and, and strong, but uh, the resistance in the US, of course, is uh, the greatest to this kind of a project. But I do think um, it will take time, but I think it's uh, uh, the symbolic aspects of it have been great at the educational level as well as the artistic level. Uh, this is how it began in South Africa, and I think it took many, many years, and it's not going to take you know, one or two days. But I, but I do think there are many internal and external factors that are weakening uh, uh, the Israelis, which is why uh, increasingly they insist, for example, on the, uh, the recognition of Israel's right to be a Jewish state. If you recall, in the 1970s, their major thing was that Palestinians and Arabs must recognize Israel's right to exist. Right. At that time, there's no such thing in, in international law as a country's right to exist. Right? I mean, the U.S., for example, never recognized the Soviet Union's right to exist. Right? It simply recognized the Soviet Union as a de facto country with whom it had diplomatic relations. The Israelis insisted on this extra-legal formula precisely to ensure their right to the usurpation of Palestinian lands. When they realized that, in fact, the PLO said, fine, we will recognize your right to exist in peace and security, uh, but not your historic right to this land, they began the new formula of that you must recognize Israel's right to be a Jewish state. When, and this is, of course, where uh, Abbas, uh, a few months ago, uh, understood that, you know, it's, uh, or actually his prime minister uh, at the time, Salam Fayyad, said, yes, yes, of course, well, there are many Jewish things, fine, you want to call it Jewish state, call it what you will, right, um, uh, speaking on behalf uh, of the Palestinians, but of course there is no uh, there is no uh, formalization of this kind of recognition. Uh, the PA realizes that um, uh, at the level of rhetoric, it has to maintain uh, a kind of commitment to the two-state solution, um, and that any attempt to recognize Israel's uh, right to be a Jewish state might be something it would be willing to do after such a two-state solution comes uh, to be. But since now everyone understands that that will not come. There is some form of arrangement being cooked at the time to see what kind of a public formula they could present which could maintain the PA in some kind of a form of power over sort of a form of bad to stands uh, that they will call uh, uh, independence. Today, we hear that the Haru, they're insisting that East Jerusalem in its entirety must be the capital of uh, the West Bank. 
uh, as we know from the uh, revealed documents that Al Jazeera uh, released uh, to the public about uh, two years ago, inside the negotiations, on the contrary. All the same negotiators who were there then quoted by actually giving the Israelis more concessions than the Israelis were asking for are the ones who continue to negotiate. So I'm, I'm not terribly sanguine about uh, what will happen. But I, do, but I think uh, this road continues to delegitimize them, and uh, this will increase the resistance inside uh, the West Bank and outside it. The question is about the options for the Palestinians for the future, that if the Palestinian Authority were to walk out of the negotiations, the economy will collapse. It is the largest employer in the country. It's prob it probably employs about 180,000 people or so, maybe, maybe slightly less, but they probably feed you know, another uh, uh, 400,000 people. So you have maybe a quarter of the population of the West Bank is dependent on the PA for income. Uh, there is no economy in the West Bank. This is a, this is a small piece of ter territory which has had $23 billion poured into it, much of which, of course, had gone through corruption into the pockets of uh, PA uh, uh, leaders. And indeed, as we know, the European Union, the Japanese, the IMF, and the World Bank have complained about the levels of corruption. This is why the US then brought Salam Fayyad to become the finance minister and then the prime minister at, in, in order to curb some of this uh, corruption. Um, there has been, uh, Palestinian agriculture has continued to deteriorate under the PA, which would have been the backbone of, of, of uh, uh, the Palestinian economy. Uh, what you have basically is, a, is a, a, an, an import sector without exports. The money that comes in, comes in. It's a comprador, I mean, it's not even a fully comprador economy. A comprador economy is based on export and import. Yeah, you, you, you export some cash crops and you bring in, and, 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 and that's basically that there's no industrialization, there's no actual production. Here, in this case, you have $23 billion poured in by, from you know, the European Union, the Americans, the Japanese, and the Gulf states, and they are used to uh, buy American products and European products and, and what have you. Uh, most of the time, even the health services that were provided have been very, very poor. Um, uh, hospitals that are needed in certain areas have not been built, even though money, in, in some cases, for example, we know of money that has been sent and allocated for uh, the improvement of the infrastructure of some schools. From it I was in Italy giving several talks uh, last week, and uh, several uh, people came and spoke to me, uh, uh, one of whom came from a foundation that actually had given money and sent money for uh, the specific school to be improved. Then they, then they went two years later to the West Bank and found that nothing had been done. And they had no, no way of retrieving their money or to follow the, uh, to pursue the corrupt person in charge. Now, um, uh, like I said, you know, the, the money that uh, is used to pay about you know, uh, 180,000 people in the security apparatus and in the bureaucracy is precisely being paid. This, this was the formula that the US and Israel had concocted, that if, if you pay them, if you give them money, they will not revolt, right? And everything else will become acceptable. But even that has become a problem. Because of the corruption, because of Israel's insistence on punishing the PA when it refuses to accede to its terms by stopping, for example, the payment, uh, the, 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 the Palestinian tax uh, revenue, which Israel collects and then refuses to give back to the PA as is stipulated in the many agreements that they've signed together. All of this has, uh, of course, affected the population. So yes, part of what the PA continues to bank on is its ability to feed the mouths of a good, you know, about 20 to 25% of the population. But 75% of the population is not getting any benefits and its situation is worse. I mean, by international World Bank indicators and IMF indicators and even the PA's own economic indicators. And those who um, benefit from the PA uh, are beginning to understand that uh, the long-term survival of this program is in jeopardy. Um, so um, there is no economy. Uh, poverty, as I said, continues. Uh, more land confiscation continues. This includes not only Palestinians in the West Bank, but even for Palestinian Bedouins in the Negev, who also more recently have been expelled off their lands by Israel several times. And this also addresses the earlier question with regards to uh, if, if Palestinians become citizens of Israel, would that you know, necessarily render the country uh, uh, one state? Um, so um, the, the PA is a collaborator 
with the occupation. It is not a resistor to the occupation. The PA is a safety valve for the occupation. It made the life of the occupation easier. It made Israel now immune to international pressure on that question. And it opened up, it improved the Israeli economy. Israel now was able to open up offices across the Arab world, including Qatar, who claims to be the, its major resistor. Uh, just yesterday, I think, the, an Israeli uh, uh, team uh, participated in some international uh, swimming uh, uh, contests uh, ongoing in Qatar, and the Israeli flag was discovered by uh, some Qatari journalists, and finally it was forced to be brought down because of the sensitivity of the issue. But nonetheless, Isra Israel has benefited internationally. It was able to repair its relations across Africa, uh, Asia, and uh, Latin America after this. Uh, uh, situation. But the PA, um, I think, has continued, its relations continue to deteriorate. Now, they're feeling that, uh, uh, I mean, they were very concerned after the fall of Mubarak. Now they feel a bit more confident after Sisi restored the Ancien Regime in Egypt. But at the same time, they realize that things are changing. That, uh, and especially in the last few weeks with Obama's change of tactic with Iran, the more recent Saudi uh, uh, public expression of dissatisfaction with the U.S. Clearly something big is happening at the level of international alliances in the region and in U.S. strategy in containing Iran and for the benefit of the uh, Gulf monarchies. And therefore, um, the PA, like Arafat in 1993, understands itself as being increasingly backed against the wall and doesn't know how to react. Arafat, as we know, in 1993, uh, had lost all his uh, funders uh, because of his stance uh, on the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein, which was mischaracterized as support for the invasion when it was actually more of a neutral position. He lost all his funding from the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, and the UAE. And then, of course, when Iraq fell, also he lost his funding from Saddam. So as a result, there was no funds. He was backed against uh, a wall and realized that he had to negotiate with the Americans. The PA is... Uh, a lot less or a lot more collaborationist than Arafat had been at that time and is willing to do anything to stay in power. It has no other option, right? Um, so unless there's major mobilization in the West Bank, and I think it's building, uh, that would weaken it. It will not become responsive. And clearly, uh, Netanyahu is not helping. He doesn't want to play the game. Netanyahu is hoping that, I mean, he wants what Jabotinsky had predicted, you know. He wants the PA to be fully abject and to declare openly there is no hope of reversing Jewish colonization. All we can do is accept it, legitimize it, and accept whatever terms we are offered. The PA is uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, the way to Netanyahu's view, but it's taking it a bit, you know, a bit of time. But who knows? Well, let's see what happens at the end of these negotiations. If I understood the question, is if, if there were uh, lawyers, international lawyers, uh, to mount a legal effort to challenge Israeli courts for confiscating Palestinian lands, could that, uh, uh, would that work? Um, I think there have been such efforts before. The problem is, of course, I mean, as we know, the, the, whole, the whole spiel uh, uh, a couple of years ago about the Palestinian Authority's application to the United Nations to be accepted as a state um, uh, was premised on the worry by Israel and the U.S. that if it becomes a state and, and becomes, then it can bring about uh, 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 cases against Israel in the International uh, uh, Court of Justice. Uh, in addition to the World Court, which it, it was able to uh, bring about uh, uh, cases before, and that this then would open Israel to all kinds of sanctions by the United Nations and other countries. Of course, the PA has not done anything of the sort, and I doubt that it would do anything of the sort. Now, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I, I'm not an international law expert, but my understanding is that, again, is, Israel refuses to apply the Geneva Conventions to the West Bank and Gaza and claims these as disputed territories. Uh, the, and, of course, as far as East Jerusalem, it says this is even not even on the table for negotiations. This is the eternal united capital of Israel. Uh, the Golan Heights, the same thing. It was annexed in 1981, so there is no negotiations about them. Uh, 
so the idea is that, you know, they, I mean, they, they are trying to say what we are doing is what we had agreed to do back in 1978 with, uh, in Camp David with Anwar Sadat, some form of autonomy plan for Palestinians. Uh, what form that would take, at, at that time it seemed more generous, I think, that what, what, or, or they claim it was more generous than that it is now. But I, I mean, um, listen, they've always had the power and uh, uh, they've, had, they've had the legal experts. Remember, Arafat signed, and, and the Palestinian team signed Oslo in 1993 with, with on, on the Israeli side, and a battery of international lawyers there was not a single lawyer on the Palestinian side, and most of the negotiators did not even know English, and did not know English well enough to actually understand the legalese in the documents. And the Israelis have always been clever about this. I mean, one of the, the, one of the legal questions that Israel has always raised, and one of its cleverest moves after 1967, was its insistence that uh, Resolution 242 speaks about the return of, quote, occupied territories, and not the occupied territories, which gives Israel leeway about which territories it could or could not return. Of course, the French version of the resolution, which is also the official language of the UN, did say uh, uh, the occupied territories. Les territoires occupés, uh, but uh, and therefore that that, that created a legal problem uh, ultimately for the Israeli interpretation. But the Israelis until today continue to adopt the French, the, the English uh, uh, text as uh, uh, the basis for 242 and say, you know, none, it said occupied territories, not all the occupied territories or the occupied territories, which means we have and 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 in this sense they have you know they. they I mean, the game is rigged in their favor in this sense. So um, I'm not sure international lawyers can do more than Palestinian lawyers. Let, let's say in Pal the, now uh, uh, there's a whole battery of Palestinian lawyers or Israeli citizens in Israel who try to fight some of this confiscation. There's a move, for example, by some Palestinian citizens, citizens of Israel to reoccupy villages from which they or their parents had been expelled in the late 40s or early 50s. Uh, but still very little has been achieved. I mean, we know in the case of the Israeli, uh, 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 the Israeli art colony of uh, Ein Hod, which is Ein Hod, the Palestinian village, it's an actual inhabitants live a mile down the road without electricity or water, while this, the Mediterranean uh, uh, town with its 18th and 19th century Palestinian homes is now home to uh, Israeli Jewish artists who see them living in a sort of a bidonville situation down the road and you know, don't give back their lands. And nothing they have done to uh, legally has been able to um, uh, return their land to them. Right? They're called in, Israeli, uh, in Israel's law as present absentees, as people who are present in Israel at the end of the war, but absent from their habitual place of residence, which is what gives Israel and the custodian of absentee property the right to confiscate their lands. So it's, uh, uh, so, I mean, to, but, but this is the thing, where people speak about transforming Israel into a non-racist state, um, many of the Zionists claim, oh, so you're calling for the destruction of Israel. And the response is, well, I mean, I'm, if you believe that Israel is the, uh, you know, some, the, 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 the 50 racist laws, then yes, what we're asking for is that those 50 laws be removed from the books. If that happens, Israel will cease to be a colonial settler state that grants colonial and racial privileges to Jews. And then it could be whatever, you, know, you can call it whatever you want. But uh, ultimately, uh, this is what has to be challenged, right? And um, Israeli Jews insist that they, will, they came to this country, they colonized it, and they settled in it so that they can have racial privileges and colonial privileges. If you were to treat them as equals, there's no reason for them to stay. And many uh, Ashkenazi Jewish leaders have said this outright. Uh, a large number of Israeli uh, European Jews have in the last 20 years applied for European passports from uh, uh, where their parents came from and have acquired a dual citizenship uh, so that in the eventuality that if they, if they were to lose racial privileges in the country, they could opt to go to Europe where they can restore them. The problem, of course, would be in that situation, what happens to uh, Asian and African Jews, the majority of whom are Arab Jews, who have no place to go, right, uh, ultimately. So um, uh, they would have to, I mean, they, they would be the ones who would stay. Uh, and, and, and some you know, optimistic scenario would be integrated in a democratic solution uh, in the country. The question is, has to do with uh, student organizing, that um, uh, student organizations uh, that work for um, 
uh, Palestinian rights uh, have dwindled in number in, in Austin and uh, they're out outnumbered by those who oppose Palestinian rights and uphold Israel's colonial rights. Um, and that if I have advice as to how to change the situation. BDS, for those who don't know, stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. Right, the idea of boycotting Israel, Israeli products, uh, calling on uh, companies to dive, uh, and universities to divest uh, from Israel, and calling on governments to impose sanctions. Um, BDS mostly uh, speaks about academic and uh, well, about cultural uh, uh, boycotts, uh, but I think it should extend, of course, to economic boycott more generally. Now. Um, I think, for example, Students for Justice in Palestine have become quite uh, uh, much larger on U.S. campuses, if I understand correctly. Uh, uh, they're increasing in cha their chapters. There are many more chapters, many more students. Uh, the Israel Apartheid Week seems to have taken off quite well across U.S. campuses in the last uh, number of years. So I'm a bit surprised. I don't know the situation in Austin well in relation to this. But um, I mean, you, we, you, you are in the country that is um, most supportive of Israel, both on a popular level and at the official level. Remember, European Union countries, governments, who uh, support Israel, support Israel in an undemocratic fashion. The majority of the European public opposes Israel and its colonial rights and supports Palestinian rights. Therefore, the, their government's uh, position on Israel is completely undemocratic in foreign policy. In the case of the US, actually, the US government's line on Israel is very democratic. It does reflect the popular support that Israel has uh, in ways that the European counterparts don't. So yes, it's an uphill battle. Um, but I think my advice to you is to uh, consult with people on other campuses and see how they were able to do it. I know Berkeley has been a, a very important uh, place. Um, even uh, uh, at Columbia University, where I am, and I, I, I don't know if you know, you know I've, I've fought a number of battles there uh, uh, against uh, the pro-Israel lobby, and um, I won. Um, and uh, you know, I, I won despite uh, uh, terrible odds, and I, I think they're, uh, they can be defeated in many ways, at, uh, academically. Um, and I think that's where resistance is important, in academic institutions and cultural institutions, and that's where the lobby actually and its supporters are most effective and strongest. People misconstrue that, thinking that the lobby is more effective in government. I don't, I don't believe so. I think the government has its own policy, the lobby supports it. But the lobby is extremely powerful in cultural and civil institutions like universities and um, I'm surprised I mean I had expected that there would be some uh, 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 hostile questions uh, this evening I'm um, disappointed that they have not come <laughs> the question has to do with increasing uh, media reports on some media reports in the US media uh, about Israeli racism especially toward African immigrants in the country of course uh, uh, Israeli racism, uh, first of all, has I mean, many branches, right? Um, uh, Israeli Ashkenazi European Jewish racism against non-Ashkenazi Jews, you know, Sephardi Jews and what is called Mizrahi Jews, was institutionalized from even before the settler colony was established. Against the Palestinians, as we know, it's enshrined in laws like the law of citizenship, the law of return, uh, uh, the law of uh, construction, and uh, uh, law of land and agriculture, etc. But in addition, of course, uh, uh, the racism toward uh, African and even Asian immigrants. But against African Jews, it would begin in the 1980s with, uh, the bringing, with bringing to Israel a number of Ethiopian Jews. Right? At that time, uh, the late Rabbi uh, Obadia Yosef, who just passed away last week, and the Ashkenazi Rabbi both objected to the arrival of these Ethiopian black Jews as not really Jewish. Uh, they're pre-Talmudic. They insisted that the men be subject to symbolic re-circumcision, that the women had to go through the mikvah. This is in the 1980s. This would be repeated again in the 1990s. Many African, many Ethiopian Jews would march uh, uh, to the airport in Israel saying, we want to go back to our country, we don't want to remain here. But subsequently they were integrated. Many of them now serve as occupation soldiers who kill Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and even in East Jerusalem. Um, however, in the last also 10 years, there's been an increase in the number of African immigrants, economic immigrants, trying to get to Europe. Failing that, they began to go through Egypt and through the Sinai to Israel and arriving there. Um, 
there's been so I, I remember within Israel itself, you, some of the Russian, uh, so-called Russian Jews who arrived, many of them, not many of them, some of them formed skinhead groups who target Jews, not only Africans, but also Jews inside Israel as Russian supremacists inside the country. So there's you know, a skinhead movement amongst them. But also they began to target uh, uh, Africans. And I mean, just three, four days ago, there was a, maybe a week ago, there was a, a video that was uh, uh, circulated in, in uh, different media. Uh, uh, on the internet and elsewhere of the major sort of riots against Africans, calling them slaves. And, and of course, Israeli officials spoke about how uh, with the increase in uh, uh, crime rates, the increase in uh, the, uh, the, the worry about of, of, uh, Israeli women being raped by Africans and what have you. Uh, some uh, African men have been beaten up, one was killed. Um, Again, you see a precedent for this even in the 1980s. At the time, you, you had a small population of a, a small group of African Americans who converted to Judaism and went to Israel. They would be opposed. Allegedly, they were they were they were they were represented as criminals. They tried to get them out uh, of the country. So the the anti-black uh, sentiment, of course, uh, uh, even at the symbolic level, was used against the Mizrahi Arab Jews, who were always called by uh, Ashkenazi Jews Schwarze Chais or black animals. Animals, right? um, and this is why the major movement against Ashkenazi Jewish supremacy in the country in the early 70s was called the Black Panthers. Right? The, many of the Mizrahi Jews saw, got inspiration from, from the American Black Panthers movement and called themselves uh, the Black Panthers or Panterim Shorim um, and fought their battles and lost in the 1970s uh, through demonstrations and what have you. Uh, so yes, of course, I mean, I, I mean, exposing Israel as racist toward all people who are not European and Jewish uh, uh, certainly helps uh, expose what the country is all about and what its policies are about and the kinds of oppression to which it's subjecting its more recent African immigrants, its call on, uh, uh, for their expulsion, its actual attempt to expel them, etc. Um, that, that could only sort of help the Palestinians who have been trying to tell the world about Israeli uh, racist policies since. But um, the problem is that, of course, the Israeli response is always ready. That, you know, we have a right to be racist. We don't support, not everyone has a right to be racist. Only we have that right, you see. Because we've earned it, what happened to us was really, really terrible. So you're right, America cannot be racist against Jews, for example, or France should not be racist against non-French. But we have the right to be racist because we are Jews, we are exceptional, and we have that right, and the people must grant us that right because we are exceptional and we have a special kind of history. So it's not that others have not been oppressed. It is that we have been oppressed more. It is not that others have not been killed. It is that we have been killed more. And this gives us a special right. right? And therefore, and this is always the exception. I mean, imagine uh, the American media and the New York Times who gives voices to people who say Israel should be recognized as a Jewish state. Imagine if anyone would say in the US that the US must be a white state. Right? Imagine if uh, the 90% of federal land uh, that is the state of Alaska, right, which is mostly owned by the federal, federal government, if this was set aside for the exclusive use of white Christians. Most of American Zionists, Jews or Christians, would be up in arms if there was such a thing. Imagine if the American flag would have uh, white symbols on it, uh, or if the American national anthem only spoke of white Americans, right? Uh, this is the situation that you have in Israel and which American liberals, or Jewish or Christian, who support Israel defend that the Israeli flag only, well, even though the country, after the massive expulsion of Palestinians today, has at least one-fifth of its population being Palestinian, uh, they're not included in the symbolism of the flag or in um, uh, the national anthem. Um, so the racism is pervasive, of course, and on so many levels. And of, yes, exposing that will always be helpful, I think, to uh, uh, stem the tide of racism against Palestinians and against African immigrants. How successful do you think Palestinian rights activists in the United States has been in challenging the mainstream terms of debate regarding Israel's occupation? To what degree um, is the policy elite making adjustments, if any, to the challenges uh, the occupation is getting in this country? I, I mean, I think uh, one cannot speak only of the occupation of 67 and, and I mean, because 
anyone can immediately argue you back and say, if the problem is the occupation of 67, the Palestinians claim that in 48 there was an occupation. Why is the occupation of 67 a problem and not 48 a problem? The, if, if you give the Palestinians anything on the lands of 1967, then you must grant them the rights in 1948, and that is Israel. Um, uh, on, in, in terms of the actual history of the situation. But nonetheless, you actually have now an attempt by uh, liberal Zionists, like J Street, for example, which is a, pretends to be a counter uh, lobby to uh, APAC, which is, it considers to be a right-wing uh, pro-Israel lobby, and it sees itself as a left-wing pro-Israel lobby. Remember, I mean, I, all discourse, all mainstream discourse in the US about the situation in, in Israel and in Palestine insists on maintaining Jewish colonial and racial privileges in the country. I think the question should always be that, you know, we, are, we oppose the inequality of granting a portion of the citizenship colonial and racial rights. I think the, the racial opposite, the, the line on, on, on colonialism and on racialism works better with American audiences because they can relate to it. The term occupation um, in the US is not terribly meaningful. Right? I mean, there, there's a joke about an Israeli who comes to New York and at JFK, um, the, the, the uh, immigration officer asks him, uh, occupation? And he says, oh, no, only in Palestine, not here, right? But um, the, the under, because, of course, uh, ultimately, occupation is, doesn't, doesn't have resonance, right, in, in, in the U.S. the way it does elsewhere. But um, not that colonization uh, is uh, uh, high, I mean, not that the American population is sensitized to the term of population, but the term racism and racialism and lack of equality and racial privileges is indeed something that resonates. Uh, and I think the previous question on the increasing racism against blacks, black immigrants in, in, in Israel also would resonate. Um, so in this sense, I think um, uh, the issue of boycott, divestment, and sanctions does address these questions. It does address not only the 67 occupation, but also the endemic racism of the Israeli settler colony itself in the 48 borders, as well as the rights of the diaspora. So it, it tries to uh, uh, address all the aspects of what happened to the wrongs uh, uh, that the Palestinians uh, have uh, been subject to by the establishment of the settler colony. And I think activists in the US today, if they, if, if they work within the framework of the, the understanding of BDS and the argument against racialism and unequal citizenship, um, as a strategy, in my opinion, they'd be a lot more successful because at the end of the day, people would say, why are you upset at the Israeli military occupation in the West Bank and how it treats them more so than, say, other oppressive governments elsewhere? And that's a legitimate question. And I, and I always say I'm, I'm concerned about them all. I mean, I speak about uh, uh, the Palestinian question because that's something I'm, uh, that, that uh, touches me personally, given the fact that my parents were expelled in 48, but I have also been active uh, in Saudi work throughout my uh, adult years on Latin America, on South Africa, on uh, Asia, and across the Arab world, not only the Palestinians. But people usually say, so why then do you want to be, why, why should we boycott only Israel and not, uh, uh, if, if, you're, if you think the US is oppressive, why not boycott the US? I, th I think there are many countries that perhaps boycotting uh, would be a very good idea. The pro but the issue of BDS is not only a moral issue, but a practical issue. So boycotting Israeli universities who render services to the Israeli occupation and to the army and, and, and is, is actually doable because Israel is a small economy. You can actually defeat them like South Africa was defeated. Boycotting American universities for rendering services to the US occupation of Iraq or Afghanistan will not work. The US is not a small country. It's the country that defines the world economy and is not easily breakable in that sense with, with, with that kind of a boycott. If you recall, Malcolm X wanted to do this, right? He wanted to take the US to the UN and have the UN put sanctions against the US as a racist country that violates uh, the human rights of black people. Martin Luther King, of course, played the game of no, it was civil rights of black people, not human rights, and therefore uh, we should not go to the UN. Um, uh, had, uh, and so there was a big controversy about precisely is it the civil rights of African Americans that are being denied or human rights, uh, which of course would have had implications at the United Nations. Um, so I think uh, uh, 
In the case of activism, uh, the issue of boycott, divestment, and sanctions should be presented as strongly as possible, not only as uh, uh, stemming from a moral claim uh, and a legal claim, but also from a practical one. Right, that Israel is not being singled out. I think those who want to boycott uh, the Saudi government for its policies, I will support them fully. I think they should start a, a BDS campaign uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia. There's no uh, reason uh, not to. But again, the question would be practicality. Where people would say, well, can you do this to a country that has uh, uh, the largest oil reserves in the world and controls you know, a huge amount of wealth? Well, I mean, it's debatable. It's, it's an empirical question. Uh, but I, I think there is no singling out of Israel. Israel is one of the worst offenders worldwide. It is probably today the only racist country by law. Many other countries are very racist in terms of practice, but it is a country that has the largest amount of racist laws on the books. Um, and this is something that we should not uh, accept. And these laws, and you know, the, we, can, we can name them, should be named in these uh, 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 in, in activism. Should be told to the media. Right? This is we are we don't we are not simply calling Israel racist to insult Israel. This is a description. We are describing the country. We are describing its laws, and we are stating facts based on factual on, on laws that discriminate between Jews and non-Jews that are on the books. This is not an attempt to insult the country country by calling it names, right? It's a, it's a factual description. I thank you all for staying and for your questions. Lovely to be here.